Hello, and welcome to Read the World. My name is Derek Bain, and I review translated literature. Today's review is going to be a very special book, B Book and Me, by Kim Sagwa, translated by Sun Hee Young, and this is from Two Lines Press, very small icon, so not sure if you can actually see that. Excuse me, I had to move up. Well, light out of the way. So, this is a tremendously weird novel. Um, very slim volume, as you can see, but feel filled with just truly inventive writing, a very unique way of telling a story and, an, and a very odd story. It, almost a parable, I think, which we'll get to. Uh, but just a tremendous work that I, I highly recommend. So let me give you B, Book, and Me. So these are three people. Me is Rang. So B, Book, and Rang are three of the characters. Glasses is another character. Sky is another character. And they live in a seaside village in South Korea. And that's really an important aspect of the novel is place because... They do not live in Seoul, and a large aspect of their understanding of the world is that they are not in Seoul. So as they drive around their little town, there's like Seoul nails, Seoul food, Seoul, you know, all these little places, but they're not in Seoul. It's very special and important when someone goes to Seoul, you know, that's kind of like making it big. If someone brings a present back from Seoul. So... First off, what's interesting about that is I, I do read a lot of Korean literature, South Korean literature, and, and typically it is Seoul-based. So here we're seeing a rural-urban divide, something that is very, very much present today, particularly in our geopolitics, uh, and existing in, in a country that I don't think of that. So you can kind of see that this is a universal divide across the world, is, is those clustered in these large, uh, prosperous economic geographic centers as opposed to those on the outskirts. And let's talk about the outskirts because this book is about people on the margins. These people are, are poor, some poorer than others. Um, I believe B is probably in a, a, she is at the part of the town that is closest to the factory, which is the, the poorest part of town. Glasses has an aunt and soul, so he is considered sort of fairly well-to-do within this group. Rang is probably somewhere in the middle. Books lives in a shack by the sea where he literally reads all the time. So that coffee shop I talked about alone, it's a bookstore slash coffee shop. His social life is traveling to alone where... There is a gentleman who's left Seoul who runs the coffee shop slash bookstore. He's his friend. He fills him up with books to read and then books or book, sorry, uh, heads back to his seaside cabin and he wants to be a hermit who just reads all the time and loses himself in that. So I think we can understand that, right? I mean, as we are right now in the beginning of March in America, the, the largest effects from the global pandemic have not quite reached us, but we know they're there. They're on our, our doorstep, and we hear harrowing stories in, in Wuhan, China, and Italy. We know it is coming here, and so there is something very apropos right now about me reviewing this book, which has a, a character that is, is trying to live that, that social isolation, right? That word and the term social distancing we've been hearing so much about in the news uh, is living that life in this sort of hermit lifestyle, but more apropos for my channel and for booktubers in general is this is someone who is he only wants to read that's all he cares about i don't even think he cares what it is you know the, the owner of alone gives him the books but he doesn't even care what it is so rang who is our first narrator and um, b does narrate a section in the middle as well but rang is our primary narrator um she just has a tough life a tough inner life as far as feeling that weight of being marginalized in her class. Um, 
a lot of this gets set off the story by some very extreme, intense bullying that she experiences. And the beginning, B, who is her one friend, comes to her aid. And those dynamics are going to shift over time. Um, B has a sick sister that really guides her psychology. I don't want to get too much into how B feels about the sister, but it is important and it is some really good work, but suffice to say it's complicated. And Book inadvertently, I mean, not thinking, I'm sorry, uh, Rang, not thinking that it's a big deal, uh, mentions in class in front of everyone that B has this sister, and that cuts off their relationship. So at that point, B no longer is a protector of Rang, and the abuse really ratchets it up by these boys in baseball caps. And um, B actually falls in with that group. So she sort of changes allegiances, becomes a girlfriend of uh, one of the leaders of the boys in baseball caps, gets her own baseball cap. So there's this, this uh, material possession that tethers her to this group that signals to outsiders that, that she is in the in group here amongst this already marginalized group. Within them, there are even more marginalized people, a big theme throughout the work. And so, Rang becomes more and more abused, socially isolated, and runs out of ideas for her life. So, suicide or madness or simply disappearing into the ether are truly options for her because there feels as if there are no other. That's a really powerful aspect of this book that I enjoyed a lot is, is really seeing the psychological toll that poverty, that social isolation, in this case forced, you know, because you are a little different, you're a little weird, you become the one that's picked on. They talk about every year there's a different one. This year it's rang. And how that, uh, what that burden and weight is like and how especially the fact that this is narrated entirely by high school kids um, and how few options and few paths out they see. So I'm going to read one section on page 69. The chapters are very, very short. The first chapter, one, we lived on the coast. That's the chapter. And they're not all that short, but there are certainly quite a few one-sentence chapters. Chapter 14, three in italics. Um, and actually, that reminds me that quickly, I do want to read this part in chapter 15. I didn't have it written on my notes, but let's do that first before we get to page 69. This will give you a great sense of her worldview and perspective and also the writing. Those who no longer play in the water are called adults. Adults work in the city. They are the ones who don't see the sky, who no longer think about clouds, stars, seagulls, or the ocean. Every weekend, adults seek out the shore with their children, carrying blankets and food. Their faces look as if they're bored out of their minds. Female adults wear enormous straw hats and rub sunscreen on their arms and faces every hour. Male adults stretch their legs and read the newspaper, and then they repeat over and over, Don't wander too far off. Don't swim too far out. You're going to get cold. You're going to get hot. Stop crying. Stop being so loud. Sit still. The adults, bored out of their minds, gather together with beers in their hands, smoke cigarettes, and grumble as they brush sand from their clothes. At night, the adults light a fire and barbecue. Sometimes a drunk man runs around howling like a wolf and jumps into the ocean, but he quickly gets back out. He looks bored out of his mind. No matter what they do, they look bored out of their minds. So I, I like how there is an aspect in reading this book, as you can see there, almost like an anthropological study. This person feels so, this, this teenager feels so outside of the bounds of society, even her own marginalized society, that she sees these as like, here's the female adults in their natural habitat, and here's the male adults. Even when there is the, the drunk howling at the moon, you know, how much beat literature did we read where that was romanticized? And here, you know, I, I love the image of, and he looked 
He stopped after a minute and looked bored out of his mind. So even that sort of momentary defiance is just another expression of their boredom and hopelessness. So page 69. He did nothing but drink for three months, then enlisted in the military. Since he got discharged, he's been working at my dad's factory. Apparently, he's saving up to study for the civil service exam. I'm scared I'll end up like him. Actually, I'm definitely going to end up like him. Dreams are expensive, which, why, which is why I can't have one. If only I had a billion won, I could have a really cool and expensive dream. But I don't have a billion won. I have exactly 1,000 won, which I stole from my mom's purse. I don't know what to do with it. I really don't know. If I just had a billion won, my sister wouldn't die. Mom wouldn't have to work at the factory, and even I could become a doctor. But since I only have a thousand won, my sister will die. My mom will continue working at the factory, and I'll grow up to be trash. I mean, that's a pretty good view there of how someone is going to feel in poverty. I can't afford to have dreams. You know, since I only have this little bit of money I stole from my mom's purse, my mom will continue working at the factory, my sister will die, I will end up trash. You know, there you're going to get that, that hopelessness. But there's something about this book, something about these characters, that I, I think the characters themselves would not admit to. But, but, but I, there is this somewhat sense of hope purely based on their youth and purely based on their ingenuity and their intelligence. They don't see it, but there does seem to be a light somewhere. The two lights in the book alone, that cafe, that becomes a light. It's a place they can go. They're, the older owner is, is magnanimous with them. He finds them funny, you know, lets them order coffee, even though he tries to talk them out of it and says they're too young. Shares a little bit of his world and experience where you can see how an odd person might find a way. And then you have books, book, I keep calling him books, book, who has found a way through his books and through his cabin by the seaside to live something like a content existence, if not a happy one. These two lights, the cabin by the sea and the alone cafe are something that all people I think of that age are, are looking for. I know I certainly was. I was looking for those lights and I did not grow up poor. I grew up firmly middle class American, which by almost every account compared to these people makes me quite rich. But I was looking for lights like all adolescent sort of teenagers are. I found lights in punk rock clubs and that was my place of refuge where I could see another way to live where I could see older people and adults even living their life as freaks in a cool way that was worth studying, worth emulating. And there are these lights within this book where you see as the reader, as an, as an adult, that even amidst this poverty and pain, yes, their options are going to be constrained. They're going to be very limited. But there's that hope that they will find themselves. They will find their place to find, again, contentment, if not happiness, and a place to feel comfortable in their place, in their bodies, in their geography, in their existence in this world. And you only really get that as a reader, again, having some life experience, because that's what's missing in our narrators, is that life experience. And you hope, as you're reading this, that they don't succumb to those worst anxieties and fears and, and truly do lose themselves, lose their bodies, fall off into the ether or something worse out of the fear that there is nothing there when we see and are kind of rooting on, like, find it. It, it will be there. Something is there. And I, I don't want to diminish the, the, the economic aspects of that, right? Because that that is real, and that, that will constrain. But there is something about the bright light of people and connectivity that can somewhat, slightly, overcome those obstacles to, again, find a home and find a way to live. 
a very beautiful book. And again, creatively, creatively written, very poetic, lyrical. Some of the scenes of, of, of them on the beach, you know, I read the one about the adults, but as they are on the beach when they're visiting Book, um, the waves coming up, crashing, and thinking about the seaside cabin where he sits and reads and makes them soup to try to bring them back. They all kind of get a sickness, like a cold from being out. And they all live in Book's cabin for a few days and drink soup and read books and talk and and they're missing from their lives. They've escaped momentarily. And, and some of that brought me quite a bit of pleasure to read and, and to imagine them in those places. So an excellent book. Great job by Two Lines Press. Kim Sagwa is definitely a writer that I'm very interested in reading more of. Again, translated by Sun Hee Wong. Beautiful cover, as you can see. And I hope you'll check that out if you have. Leave a note, uh, drop a line in the comments if this has kind of come across, you've thought about reading it, you've heard something about it. Um, a very odd book, and that's right up my alley. I like the weirdness. My next review is going to be Beautiful by Massimo Cuomo, translated from the Italian by Will Shutt, and this is from Europa Editions. So, thanks as always, and be good to folks.